Welcome to the Phil Vogel podcast, where we talk dealership mergers and acquisitions, as well as all the other elements affecting dealers' operations, trends, and technology. So if you like what you hear or see today, please hit the subscribe button below. And if you don't care for it, well, hit the subscribe button anyway. Today's show sponsor is Vogel Strategies. Vogel Strategies is the boutique automobile dealership mergers and acquisitions firm based at the tip of Silicon Valley on the San Francisco Peninsula. Vogel Strategies does little to no marketing, but rather relies upon their reputation of getting deals closed, clear lines of communication and managing expectations, as well as delivery over delivering superior results for their dealers. Vogelstrategies.com. Our guests for this show are Cliff Banks and Steve Greenfield. Both Cliff and Steve are well known to our industry. Cliff is the founder of The Banks Report, where he provides analysis and insights to the automotive retail space with a focus on OEM and vendor brand and strategy, retail technology, as well as dealership acquisitions. Steve Greenfield is the CEO and founder of Automotive Ventures, where he specializes in assisting automotive technology entrepreneurs, fundraising, while also providing transactional guidance. And he recently closed a $7 million fund to invest in automotive technology startups. He is prolific on LinkedIn and his, uh, with his news and uh, analysis of our industry. So without further ado, I give you Cliff Banks, and Steve Greenfield. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us, Phil. Thanks. You bet. How's everybody today? Good. Doing Excellent. great here, Phil. Excellent. So I want to, let's just kind of get right into this, fellas. Um, is this the year, the COVID year, where all the trends and strategies change for car dealers? Um, it's been disruptive to say the least. There's good news and bad news, but certainly COVID has accelerated a lot of uh, different trends. And I'm I'm curious what your guys' take is on this. Um, you know, let's start with you, Cliff. Yeah, it's it certainly has changed a lot. Uh, uh, I think there's an era of uncertainty still. Um, you know. Uh, I think right now the impact that we're feeling is the the chip shortage and the question surrounding how long is that going to continue and that actually may even have more of a uh, i think uh more of an impact than what COVID will have long term possibly I mean, we'll, we'll see uh, right but uh you know the chip shortage is very possibly could change how automakers approach manufacturing and and uh sales i mean both ford and gm's uh, executives our ceos have been very clear in saying that they they are pushing their companies to be more uh customer experience focused and less focused on the sales and uh, transaction model that they are today which means fewer products in the market uh or fewer vehicles into the market i guess because now or up to now it's been more of a sell it or build it and sell it uh, you know and, and that's an incentive driven environment and they want to move away from that we'll see if they're able to right long term but so you, talking about it. what do you think what do you think steve yeah i mean I'll, I'll echo what cliff said you know it was just a year ago where we had you know this convergence of auctions being closed many dealerships being closed by state uh, regulators and um, you know every dealer in the country raised their hand and said look i need to figure out how i'm going to sell cars online you know and then we had these weird dynamics last year with more demand than there was supply which drove up used car prices and you know, we, we have now another peak where we've got the shortage of new cars which is driving up used car prices and now we've got a shortage of not only new but used cars so i would say phil i would answer your question is um, you know, shame on the industry if they don't take the last 12 months as, you know, good learning opportunities for the future. Your mm -hmm. dealers have now printed three in a row of record profitability, like all time record profitability. The OEMs as well are printing quarters of like all time record profitability. You know, having a resilient, you know, US consumer who's still buying and servicing their vehicles 
while, while you know inventory constraints, I think you know, we, we should have all learned something. Dealers should have learned how going forward they can operate with fewer employees and fewer costs. The OEMs the same. And you know, if the OEMs do go back to the old like overproduction and then pushing cars into fleet and then over incenting cars, shame on them. But you know, we should come out of this hopefully with both OEMs and dealers learning something about suppressing their cost structures and you know just doing business differently going forward. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great perspective. I I was going to ask this question further down the uh, in the podcast, but I might as well ask it right now. You know, one of the things, what do you, you know, the dealers have their framework agreements with the OEMs, and we, t you know, Cliff touched on it a little bit about the focus on the customer experience, and uh, you know, I'm wondering, you know, because I've been involved in a few deals of late where these framework agreements come into play. And certainly on the large deals, the Lithia acquisition uh, uh, keys, you know, there was, you know, the, these deals need, certain deals need to be spun out because of framework agreements and, and what have you. But we see it, um, see it around. And, and what do you th have any thoughts on those framework agreements in terms of, and just for our audience, those that don't know what framework agreements are, it's a really an agreement between a dealer group and the a particular manufacturer uh, specifically what the relationship is the number of stores they can own in various markets etc so any thoughts on that cliff knows much more in this area than i do my perspective is you know you, you introduced lithia as an example let's talk about lithia for, for a minute right i mean i think that historically sure. the oems have somewhat been hesitant about market concentration so they've looked at the large dealer groups and said look we, we don't want in cases you know, a dealer group, one one particular owner to own too many physical stores of ours and try to moderate some of that. And I think that that, that there's a new era, I believe. I mean, this is gonna be changing. I think that the, um, the, the OEMs are gonna embrace the fact that Alithia, as an example, is a really good operator. You know, they have great brand integrity. Um, they're, they're very, very efficient and um, are good kind of stewards of these brands. So I, I think that, you know, what we've known in the past in terms of, you know, framework agreements likely is changing very quickly. And I, and I think going forward, the OEMs are gonna much more want to align themselves with what they perceive to be kind of the winners in the space. And I think Lithia would be a, a great example of one where, you know, they'll, they'll have much more flexibility and we'll be moving away from these rigid framework agreements going forward. Yeah, I think that's a, you make a great point, but I, I also think, aside from the framework agreements, I think I had a conversation in the last month with two different uh, OEM executives uh, who will remain nameless, but you know, both of them, with the conversations we were together in person, and both of them felt that this was an opportunity to really reshape the industry. And what that means from the OEM perspective versus the dealer perspective leaves to be seen. But... That said, I think that there, but the conversations we had, it was around the customer experience. It was around, you know, framework agreements a little bit, and it was also around uh, corporate image, the CI uh, right. requirements. And I think that that's going to be something that uh, they, most OEMs, you know, I think we're in agreement uh, that there there's there's going to be a real opportunity to reorganize this business and i'm hoping that it's for the positive for all involved yeah i mean you say that though i, I do think that there's more consolidation coming i think it'll be harder and harder as a single point operator to be, be relevant and not to say that if you've got a single point in a big dense urban area with a good brand yeah i mean you, you'll, you'll be fine standing alone but i think in some cases it's going to be really really hard you know the, the 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 dealers that are going to be more aggressive with buying up locations and then really consolidating the back end are going to find mm. themselves just having healthier profits overall you know we're going to come out of COVID, and you know i may not be popular for saying so but we'll, we're going to get back very quickly i believe to the dynamics that dealers were facing prior to COVID, you know, with margin compression on the front end, I think, you know, the transparency that inevitably is gonna to come to the back end, you know, the, the trade, the financing of the cars and then the insurance products, transparency will come. I mean, part of it will be during from some of these online players like Carvana, Shift and Vroom, where consumers will see right. very transparently, you know, what an extended service contract is for a given car. But I think that just by the nature of the internet, it's brought transparency to every single vertical 
just look at Amazon and how much transparency consumers have on any you know consumer package good they buy on Amazon now. And you know the, tra the transparency the inter internet has brought has not been friendly to dealers on the front end. It's really the primary reason that the margin's been driven out of the front end of the car deal. And I think post COVID, when we get back and we kind of re-equilibrate re around inventory, both on new and used, we're gonna get back to like these great consumer experiences. The consumer is gonna be more armed than ever with data. And you know, the dealers are gonna get squeezed. And I think it will then favor the dealers that are able to go out there and, and buy stores at, at, at a reasonable multiple, the world that you live in, Phil, and then you know, consolidate back-end functions such as marketing, um, uh, accounting, HR, and um, th there'll be an advantage to dealers that are able to consolidate. And I think if I've got a, you know, a poor brand as a single point, it's gonna be really hard for me to stay relevant. Yeah, I agree. I, I think you nailed it. That was great insights. I, you mentioned uh, some of the, the Carvanas and Vrooms and Chefs of the world. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, M&A deals in the tech space. Uh, mm. uh, so what, uh, from your perspective, Steve, what do you, the last six months, what are the top two uh, tech M&A deals in your opinion and why? Well, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of heat late, lately on the sort of digital retailing space. You know, Roadster sell, sold to CDK, and here last mm -hmm. week, Gobble Goo sold to Reynolds. But I mean, I think th those aside, because there are big implications there, I, I would say the theme that I'm most interested in tracking is kind of what I've been talking about, like this blurring of lines between retail and wholesale. And the, the, mm -hmm. the best example probably is, uh, you know, CarGuru's bet um, late last year on car offer, right? So CarGuru's competes with the likes of AutoTrader and Cars.com and TrueCar to get consumer eyeballs on one side of the marketplace and then connect those with dealer's inventory on the other. Well, you know, Car Guru has made a pretty bold move with the, um, you know, majority investment in car offer to help dealers with more of what I would say is a holistic used car solution. So now, you know, dealers who use Car Gurus can use car offer one to source cars to make sure they're stocking the cars that are going, going to better address consumer needs on sites like car gurus but also dispose of cars so if they attempt to sell right. cars on car gurus and that doesn't work out they can now dispose of them without having to go to the auction right so you see these big consumer marketplaces like car gurus starting to get into and encroaching on what was historically a clean line between consumer marketplace and b2b marketplace or you know the, the auctions which by the way, the physical auctions are also getting attacked by startups like ACV auctions that just right. went on public as well. So that's one example, the car gurus car offer. Um, and then in, in yeah, the we had, vein, just, to, just to, not to interrupt you on that, we had uh, yeah. uh, Bruce Thompson on the show a few weeks ago from car offer. And we talked about that. Sure. What a phenomenal transaction for him and, uh, and, and the whole car offer team. But really to your what you were just saying i mean the the way that because we talked about why that deal came together and the value add for both was was tremendous yeah yeah no i agreed and then, and then you know a, a mirror image of that i would say in the same sort of vein is um you know carmax interestingly buying edmonds and at mm. first blush you look at that and you're like wait a second edmonds was historically known as a new car upper funnel shopping right. experience where consumers very early in the new car shopping process would get on, see reviews, see, you know, editorial and, and start to make decisions around which minivan do I want? You know, and you've got CarMax, which has divested itself fully of all the new car stores that they used to have. It's a used right. car store only, the largest retailer of used cars in the U.S. And, and, and they, they, they buy Edmonds wholly. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a bit uh, puzzling. But um, you know, at, at, at first glance, you look at it and say, you know, what does Car CarMax need? Well, CarMax sees clear and present danger from the Carvanas of the world getting traction, and they need more of a significant online presence, right? CarMax has right. to position themselves in the future to the consumer much more around and aligned with the Car Carvana value proposition. That's one. Two is they need to get a source of inventory, even pre-COVID. And before we had these shortages on used cars, I mean, one, one of dealers' primary challenges is getting a good quality source of used cars. And they, they, they can provide their sort of guaranteed trade-in offer to Edmonds 
uh, buyers. But you know, it, it's it's very interesting when you have the largest retailer of used cars in in the country buy an online third party marketplace. Yet again, you know, what were historical partitions and barriers are now starting to get broken down. Right. I, I think, yeah, I think you nailed it. I think, but he has some great insights as to that, that CarMax deal. That, I mean, I, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that acquisition, the Edmonds deal, right? I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see what they're, they have in mind and where they think the value add is for them. I, so when you look at uh, thinking, looking forward, um, what potential automotive tech M&A, other additional deals do you see happening maybe this year or the first part of next year? Or what's- Yeah, so there's, there's, some, there's some big deals in the hopper, which you know isn't surprising given where valuations are. You know, we've got a really strong stock market that's helping uh, support really good you know, private company valuations, and then a lot of private equity money out there looking to deploy. So, you know, I think we're going to continue a um, very healthy M&A environment, both, you know, in the physical dealerships, but also the automotive technology. So, and we'll, we'll see a couple of really, really big deals this year. Um, I think that, um, you know, I speculated at the beginning of the year that at some point mm -hmm. here, Reynolds and Reynolds has to be in play. You know, very, very publicly and not to get into it, but, you know, I mean, if you just do a search for Bob Brockman, you'll see sort of like the right. negative press that, that he has out, out in, in the market. And, you know, that, that's yeah. got to also provide some uncertainty around ownership going forward. And I, I suspect, you know, that's still a, a, a primo asset when you look at like sort of like the two big players in this in the DMS play uh, space being CDK and Reynolds. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the owners of Reynolds must be sitting here and saying, is this the right time to be doing a transaction? And that's going to be a very, very big transaction if that one gets done. And we'd love, you know, when Cliff gets back on here, if we're able to ask him what his perspective on a Reynolds transaction. But I mean, there, I don't think anyone would be surprised if we saw a Reynolds transaction this year. And then the, the right. other big thing that, you know, is loitering. When you say, when you like, say, wait, when you say, when you say Reynolds transaction, are you saying like a sale of the, of Reynolds? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of went, went on the record in January to say that was one of my, my my guesses for a big transaction that would happen this year. I mean, I think it's inevitable it happens sometime, whether it happens mm -hmm. between now and the end of the year. We've only got, you know, six months left. But I, right. I do think that that, that one's got to be, I mean, there have to be people in Dayton starting to think about that. And I'm sure the investment bankers must be circling. Yeah, I think you're right. So and that, and I, Yeah. I just think that the Reynolds, to your point, we've discussed it at some length on this show with different guests, and and you know mentioned the Brockman. It's just it's just tainted. So uh, there's yeah. it's it's got to go. Something's going to give there, right? If you're especially from yeah, your agreed. point around the other investors, right? Um, agreed. Agreed. A question: um, You are so in touch, in tune with kind of the uh, the SaaS or you know the software companies that are the startups. So tell me what, um, is there a particular startup, uh, whether it's SaaS or used car provider or other um, newcomer that you are kind of, uh, has caught your attention? Well, I mean, we're kind of uniquely positioned to see a lot of early stage stuff now, right? So we just launched mm -hmm. the fund. We've made, um, as of this morning, nine, nine investments. So um, we're investing and we're putting really small check sizes, like a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, into very yep. early stage automotive tech companies. So um, you know our 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 doors are now open and we're getting a lot of inbound interest. So we're seeing a lot of things. But you know I, I'm I'm probably most intrigued, you know, for the benefit of the audience here today, in finding technologies that are going to help dealers kind of weather the storms coming in terms of like margin compression, right? So one of the first companies we invested in. Is a company called WarCloud, W-A-R-R-C-L-O-U-D, and what, what what they're doing is they're helping dealers process the, the warranty claims in their service department and saving money as a result. So what was in the past a rather painful and clunky experience, where they would either have a clerk and or they would outsource it to sort of a mom and right. pop shop, now they can you know basically run it through WarCloud, which is a software uh, system which allows them to make sure. The claim gets submitted correctly to the OEM. They get paid quicker. There aren't any errors and save money in the process. So I think it's just a good example of, of technologies that um, are out there and have to emerge in the future to help dealers operate more efficiently and um, you know mm. get more done with fewer people. 
but also, you know, just some of these historical manual processes that we've seen in dealerships have to get automated. And it's, it's, it's an area of our sort of like investment thesis that I'm really excited about exploring. Yeah, that's a great, I had not heard of War Cloud at all, but boy, oh boy, as a former dealer and, you know, guy that does m and with dealers all the time, that is a legacy, I call it a legacy business, right? The like kind of the file cabinet, you know, let's, let's pull this right. out of here. You know, I mean, so I've got, let's, let's talk about War Cloud just a little bit more in depth. I, 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 that is a compelling mo model. So is the, I know, you know, some of the issues around dealers and warranty claims, I mean, yes, it is a clunky kind of old legacy business. So I can imagine, I used to say that uh, FCA or then Chrys well, Chrysler back in the day used to really finance their business on, you know, warranty and incentive audits. And, right. you know, because it, they were so <laughs> onerous and, and what have you to their dealers and, and what have you. But um, I could see where the compliance component of, you know, so can you talk to that a little bit? I mean, do you know enough about that to, to address it? Yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, if you're going to be submitting claims back to the OEMs, they have to abide by all of the OEMs rules, right? So there, there right. aren't ever any issues where they aren't in compliance. And the audit trail is always there. It's all electronic now. So it, it really helps the dealer, one, cut labor costs out, but also mm -hmm. to your point, you know, removes errors, make sure you are in compliance, and gets the whole cycle of getting paid quicker. You know, it's interesting. So, yeah, I love that. And, the, you know, it takes uh, the open RO issue um, to a whole new level. I, one of the other things I, I could see where is, you know, the I used having been through different audits uh, myself, I always wondered, you know, sometimes, you know, you go through the audit and they're telling you all the things that you did wrong and the, the chargebacks that they're going to impose or want to impose. But yet they never... I always said, okay, so you got all the debits. So where are the credits of the audit? <laughs> right, what? Right. Well, it's an audit, right? It's an audit, right? Well, yeah. Well, so audit means balance. And so if you're checking this to find out where, you know, we did something incorrectly and you're going to debit us, we're, we're, there's bound to be instances where we uh, did things uh, correctly, but we didn't take credit for it. So anyway, I can see where that, that where that might go. That's interesting. I don't think that, that works with like the IRS either. Want. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, talk. Let's talk a little bit more about your fund. Uh, I think that that's uh, it's compelling, and I think that you know while we've seen a lot of startups in the space, what's your overall vision for for the fund and and. Um, just kind of tell us about that a little bit. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I've been in the auto industry for about 20 years and, you know, have had a chance, thankfully, to interact with all kinds of entrepreneurs across the spectrum from, you know, very early stage to guys who are, you know, have just had exits and have done very well for themselves. And one of the recurring themes that we've seen is the fact that there isn't a lot of, like, very early stage capital. You know, there's a lot of, like, private equity and VC folks that once, once a, a company's got some traction and they've got a bunch of revenue coming in, it's kind of de-risk. So we're, we're trying right. to hunt very early to find these entrepreneurs that may have no revenue and customers yet or may have the first handful of revenue and customers and, and help them, um, not only with you know, so, some money coming in the door, but also help them make connections and get introductions, et cetera. We, um, we've got about 70 investors who have invested in our fund, 15 of whom are dealership principals who have mm -hmm. multiple dealerships. So we can instantly turn that on and you know get, get a vendor into stores right away and get them testing it and getting testimonials. And then they can share it their 20 groups, et cetera. But um, right. we've also got a lot of automotive tech entrepreneurs who have had exits. So you know over the years, I, I've, I've come to know a lot of these folks and I'm very appreciative. They've had faith in me as a first time fund manager to invest right. in our fund. And you know they really like it because one, they, they and the companies we're investing in, but also, I mean, I can bring them in in a mentoring capacity to really help energize growth, right? So th this, um, this kind idea like, about you know, similar to it, yeah, similar to an uh, executive in residence. Exactly right. Exactly right. So um, I, I think that it's a great benefit to early stage companies to consider taking money from us because we aren't just dumb money that's going to sign them a check. We really will help introduce them to people in the industry 
introduce them to dealerships that can test out the technology, get them connected with entrepreneurs who have had successful exits in the space so they don't stumble and they don't run into roadblock that they would otherwise hit. And then the flip side, mm. I think for our investors, it's exciting for them. You know, a, a typical case is, you know, I'll talk to a, a, a dealer principal and they'll be like, I really like investing in you for two reasons. One is, you know, I can get hands on and I understand what you're investing in. But also because, you know, we're only putting in a small check size, in many cases, um, these folks can invest alongside us. So, you know, we mm -hmm. put in 100 or 200,000 on five of the nine deals we've invested in so far, our, our, our LPs, our limited partners, the investors in our fund have co-invested sure. alongside us. So we're trying to really structure a win-win here and get outsized returns for the LPs and get really, really good outcomes from the companies we're investing in. You know, I think what you're doing, Steve, is so smart because you understand this space. And so many, uh, you know, it's a typical venture model, but a friendly venture model, right? Where your investors, the LPs, can decide, you know, co-invest alongside of you. And, but I love this. I, I think it's a great idea conceptually, but also to your point around having these executive residents potentially, and also, you know, SEMs, subject matter experts, where you can bring those people into the loop that have been there, done that with your uh, new startups. I, and, and because you're not a generalist, you know, and because it's very specific in terms of automobile software, I think it lends itself to, I'm surprised, was your fund uh, oversubscribed? It was. We had a five million dollar target, and we came in at seven million, which, in, in by all all indications, is a really small fund. But um, yeah. no, I, I was very pleased that we came in oversubscribed and had a lot of interest. Like I said, we've got seventy uh, folks who have invested in the fund, so I'm very pleased and very appreciative of their support. Yeah, I think that the, you're on it. Uh, that's very compelling. I can see where that, you know, your next fund uh, could probably. You probably be starting that relatively, maybe the, by the end of the year, maybe, you think? Well, I figure 18 months, you know, and we'll have burned through this initial capital. Mm -hmm. I think for a you know, $7 million fund, we'll probably end up making 25 investments. We've made mm -hmm. nine so far. So, you know, we'll, we'll keep up a pretty good pace here. And, you know, probably sometime in the next year, year and a half, we'll start thinking about fund too. Great. So let's talk about um, SPACs. So for those sure. in the audience that have not heard of the SPAC, it's a, I'll let Steve describe it a little bit. I mean, what it's SPAC is, is an acronym for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. And uh, so I think, you know, I, I've been involved in, or been aware of SPACs for God, about 10 years now. Um, and we've, I always thought that it was an interesting, compelling business model and wondered, you know, and there were a lot of, failures and kind of deals that uh, did not do well many years ago when SPACs initially came on and the regulators were questioning a lot of things. But we have seen a flurry of activity mm -hmm. in this space when it comes to not just automotive, but let's talk about, talk a little bit about the SPACs and, and, and how it all works with automotive, um, you know, software and startups. Yeah, I mean, so, so they have, to your point, Phil, I mean, this concept has been around since the 90s. And, you know, originally it was like a blank check corporation or mm -hmm. a shell corporation where you'd literally like take a company public that didn't have any assets other than just cash. And then you would use the opportunity to go find a private company to buy it. And there would be like a reverse takeover where that company then would inherit the public listing of the shell company that was already public, but only had cash on the balance sheet. And, um, you know, it has been a sort of like a flavored du jour over the last like 18 months. There have been right. many more SPACs than there have typical IPOs. And that's for a few reasons. Um, one of which is a fast path, right? If I have a private company, I can get, get, get one of these SPACs and get partnered with them and de-SPAC and become the public company within a few months. So in terms mm -hmm. of speed to market, it's quicker. Number two is there's a lot less red tape. And that has come back to haunt SPACs. If you've been following the press, there maybe should be a little bit more regulation and red tape and sure. the SEC has stood in. 
And then the other thing, most importantly, if you look at any of these SPAC presentations, and I've got a bunch of these presentations now on the Automotive Ventures website, because I figured people would want to see them. So if anybody wants right. to see any of these decks, I've been collecting all the the, um, the um, automotive and mobility related SPAC decks. So you can go to Automotive Ventures and see them. And one thing you'll notice is they all project five years. When you, when you mm. have a traditional IPO process, you are not allowed to have forward looking forecasts, period, right. full stop. With a SPAC, I can have a SPAC and like these electric vehicle manufacturers, and then you know, project out that you know, in year five, I'm gonna be generating $100 billion in revenue because I'm selling all these cars. Well, it's, it's unfair for an unsophisticated investor who looks and says, oh, okay, so I'm looking at the SPAC presentation, seeing $100 right. billion of revenue. It's like, okay, I, I'm gonna invest. One of the reasons that IPOs cannot forecast out is because they don't want to mislead investors um, and have them gravitate towards these you know, long-term goals, which may or may not ever play out. And I think um, that, that combination of like being a, a fast path, little to no regulation, and having these forward-looking you know, financial models that aren't permitted in IPOs has gotten some of these SPACs in, or so the companies that have gone public via these SPACs into hot water. And you've seen, I mean, I, I won't mention any names, but we're seeing right. almost weekly some of these EV manufacturers that are either, you know, may not ever produce a vehicle and have had billions and billions of dollars of market capitalization or may run out of money. And there may be a, you know, a, a huge down round in terms of valuation when that company has to go raise money because they just didn't raise enough money to begin with to actually get a car produced. And it's sad, but I mean, it, it's just to your point, it's like, you know, it's a sign of the times. Things are really frothy. You know, in, in a world where, you know, daily we see Bitcoin and Dogecoin and we right. see, you know, NFTs and all these things, there's a lot mm. of money and speculation going into the market right now. And, um, you know, I, I think things are frothy. Wh whether that froth will continue, nobody really knows, but things are definitely frothy right now in the market. Yeah, no, I think I think you you did a great job explaining what a SPAC is and and also the pitfalls and, and benefits of it. I. You know, I I, I, be, I keep waiting for a SPAC roll up uh, of franchise new car dealerships. Um, under you know the group, I'm I, I'm waiting for that. Have you heard anything uh, on that front at all? I I uh, haven't, although I, I've heard there may be a transaction before between now and the end of the year with um, something going public, but it, it, it may very well be through a SPAC. I'm, I'm not certain if it'll be more of a traditional IPO process or a SPAC, but you know, if I had a private company right now and I wanted to go public, the best path is through a SPAC because it's a, it's a sure. lot easier, a lot less red tape and faster. I mean, it's, there, there, there's a lot of negative sentiment, but you know, through this process, we'll look back and there have been a, gr a, a great number of really great private companies that have gone public over the last 18 months via SPAC and we, we can't paint all of these SPACs with the same paintbrush. No, absolutely not. And, and I think what's unique about the SPAC, and you talk about kind of the process of, you know, a management, you know, company going public with no assets. And then that company, basically what people are doing are be betting on, you know, management. Um, the traditional SPAC uh, was, you know, sometimes they didn't even know what vertical they were going to go into. And this, you know, when you talk about, SPACs as it relates to automotive technology companies or uh, dealership. I think that the, you know, the, the ability to bet on the jockey, uh, the, uh, in this, you know, the management of the company is a, it's a very unique one. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll see, we'll see more. I mean, and think, unless yeah. things slow down, there's no indication. And also keep in right. mind, there's something like 200 of these um, public company shell companies that are out there right now hunting for private companies, right? So, and the other thing I didn't mention is when one of these um, uh, companies goes public and starts hunting for a private company to de spac right. they have they have they have 24 months, so they've only got so the clock is ticking right. for all these companies. So there will be a, a whole bunch more of private companies that go public via spac over the next 18 months because there's you know hundreds of these spacs out there hunting right. for targets right now. Look, at, exactly, great point. You know, uh, I'm sorry that we lost Cliff, Steve, uh, it, but I got to tell you, I, I, I hope that we can do this again. I'd love to do, we'll get Cliff back on uh, another time and, you know, but I would love to do this maybe towards the end of the year or the first part of next year and kind of 
recap, see how we did uh, yeah. with our insights, right? The crystal ball, but also be kind of do a, a look forward if, if you guys are agreeable to that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I mean, you know, I think not, not enough people in the industry try to forecast out what's going to happen in the future. And I think we should, you know, make some gambles here because I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of change coming to the industry any way you slice it. It's an exciting yep. time for all of us to be in the industry. And man, we are going to see a lot of change and a lot of M&A activity. There's no doubt. I think you're absolutely right. I, I can't thank you enough, Steve. And thank you to Cliff. Uh, I'm sorry that Cliff got froze up and what have you, but uh, we will get him on next time. But Steve, before I let you go, please tell uh, our guests and audience how to follow you or reach out to you. Um, what's the best way to connect socially or analog? Great. No, th thanks. I mean, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I try to post as regularly as I can really relevant content for the industry. Go to automotiveventures.com and uh, sign up for my newsletter if you get a chance. And uh, I'm open to um, positive criticism around things I should cover in the future. But I, I try every month to cover good content that's really relevant to folks in the industry and publish that every month. Great. Well, Steve, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And well, we will look forward to having you and Cliff back uh, at the end of the year or first part of next year. And so until next time, everybody, thanks for joining the Phil Vogel podcast. We'll see you. Bye-bye.